Hello, this is Joy News. Shortly we'll be crossing over to the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences where the Constitution uh, Day lecture is going to be held uh, shortly. And we do know that that lecture is to commemorate Constitution Day which has been celebrated or commemorated today. And uh, that lecture would be brought by Professor uh, Philip Bonzi Simpson. He is the rector of Gimpa. Uh, we do understand that the president is in attendance at that lecture. Uh, some ministers of state as well as uh, representatives of political parties as well. So let's cross over and listen to that lecture which is on the theme constitutionalism in Ghana's fourth republic towards uh, functional performance. And that as I indicated will be delivered by Professor Philip. Bonzi Simpson. Your Excellency, the President of the Republic, Nana Adodankwe Kufuado, the Right Honorable Speaker of Parliament, Professor Aaron Michael Kwe, Ministers of State and Senior Members of Government, Distinguished Invited Guests, Friends from the Media, Ladies and Gentlemen, it is my singular honor to introduce the chairperson for this maiden Constitution Day public lecture. Our chairperson is a proud product of Wesley Girls Senior High School and Abri Girls Senior High School. She had her bachelor's degree in law from the University of Ghana and was called to the bar in 1969. Your Excellencies, Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, our chairperson worked in the Attorney General's Department from 1973 to 1989, rising through the ranks to principal state attorney in charge of the Eastern Region. She was appointed a High Court judge and became supervising judge of Ashanti region in 1989. In September 1999, our eminent chair was appointed judge of the Court of Appeal and in 2008, a Supreme Court judge where she worked until her retirement in 2014. She has served on several boards, committees and associations, but I do not intend to excite you too much with a long litany of achievements. Having recognized her dedication to public service, the Republic of Ghana on 29th October 2016 conferred on our chairperson the state honor of the member of the Volta MV. His Excellency the President of the Republic in October 2017 appointed her as the first female chairperson of the Civil Service Council. Invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, I introduce to you our chairperson, the eminent retired Supreme Court Judge, Justice Rose Constance Owusu. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, your chairperson, my lord, your audience. Thank you. Your Excellency, the President of the Republic of Ghana, Nana Ado Dankwa Ekufuadu, the Right Honorable Speaker of Parliament, Professor Mike Aaron Okwe, Ministers of State, members of the Diplomatic Corps, Distinguished invited guests, friends from the media, ladies and gentlemen, I am greatly honored and at the same time humbled to be given the opportunity to chair the, fair, the, made, the maiden edition of the Constitution Day public lecture. The 7th of January, is significant to Ghanaians for a number of reasons. 7th January 1993, 
was the day the current constitution came into force for the Fourth Republic of Ghana. 7 January has since been institutionalized as the day on which new heads of state are sworn into office. Significant as the day may be, it is this year that the government, with the support of parliament, has declared it as a statutory public holiday in order to acknowledge our collective efforts as a country in ensuring that the tenets of democracy, the rule of law, and principles of constitutionalism are upheld as indicated in the concept notes of the Ministry of Information. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the Constitution Day public lecture, which has just been introduced, is extremely unique and worth celebrating by all meaning, all well-meaning Ghanaians to remind us of the source of the enviable level of peace and stability Ghana is enjoying as a nation. It is my hope that this public lecture will serve as an advocacy platform for policy formulators and implementers, constitutional lawyers, politicians, civil society organizations, and all other stakeholders to rekindle national interest in the supremacy of our constitution and safeguard all against arbitrary use of power. Ladies and gentlemen, political leadership and all other persons in positions of responsibility should note that they hold their positions in trust for the generations to come and should be mindful of their utterances and not to say or do anything that will destabilize or shake the foundations of our constitution. Your Excellencies, in the in context of the uninterrupted democratic dispensation of the Fourth Republic of Ghana, it is important that we do not take for granted the peace and stability we are enjoying as a nation. Having, having traveled this path for 26 years exactly today, it is time to engage in collective introspection of how far we have come as a nation and to appreciate the successes chalked under the Constitution so that together we can strategize and move our nation forward politically, economically, and socially for the benefit of all Ghanaians. Ladies and gentlemen, it will be a big tragedy if we fail to ensure that we reap the benefits of the democratic path that we have chosen as a people under the guidance of the 1992 Constitution. I am certain that none of us could escape from the consequences of our inactions. It is important for us all to continue to deepen our democracy and allow the rule of law to work. Therefore, organizing such educative programs for all of us to share our views as well as tap into the experiences of other statesmen and women for the benefit of posterity is critical. Distinguished guests, the institution of this annual lecture is timely, considering happenings in recent past, and I'm convinced that we all have to be involved in this discourse to enable our people understand the tenets of the Constitution and the opportunities open to all Ghanaians to be heard, legitimately seek redress and sustain the rule of law. Ladies and gentlemen, may I take the opportunity 
to thank everyone here, especially the general public, for making it a point to be here this evening. I am sure that with the expertise lined up, we will have an extremely interesting and educative lecture this evening. On this note, I accept in humility to chair the occasion and believe that you would all assist me to make it a successful one. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we can do better than that. Another round of applause for the former Justice of the Supreme Court of Ghana. Now, we are here for a, 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 something very, very important. Today happens to be the first ever Constitution Day, and at least it's another holiday for most of us, so we're all very grateful to... So for the Constitution Day public lecture, the lecture is going to be delivered by a professor of law. He is a former founding dean of the Faculty of Law of the University of Cape Coast. And of course, he also holds a postgraduate diploma in education from the University of Cape Coast and also an SJD in corporate law from the University of Toronto in Canada. And he also has an LLM in human rights from the University of Saskatchewan. Yeah, he's just going around collecting degrees. He's also a qualifying, or he also has a qualifying certificate for enrollment as a barrister and solicitor from the Ghana School of Law. And he has an LLB degree from the University of Ghana, amongst others. So there are many things we can say about this particular individual, but one thing we can say is that indeed he is a professor. Ladies and gentlemen, to deliver the lecture for this particular occasion is the professor, the professor, Philip Abel Bonzi Simpson. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together. Your Excellency, the President of the Republic of Ghana and Commander-in-Chief of the Ghana Armed Forces. The Right Honorable Speaker, Honorable Ministers, Parliamentarians present, Learned Justices of the Superior Courts, Chief of Defense Staff and Service Commanders present, religious, traditional, and educational leaders, judges and magistrates, metropolitan, municipal, and district chief executives, bureaucrats, technocrats, teachers, workers, parents, guardians, students and pupils, members of the media, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It is a particular privilege to be nominated to speak to the maiden issue of these public lectures to commemorate Constitution Day. And I hope in the next hour or so to address the topic constitutionalism in Ghana's fourth republic towards functional performance. The topic itself suggests two aspects to it. A first aspect which invites us to address the topic of constitutionalism, and a second aspect which contextualizes that in the Fourth Republic. 
How did constitutionalism, if at all, and how at all, come to be in the Fourth Republic? How is it working if there are deficiencies and flaws because in matters human, they are likely to be. What could this be? And finally, what suggestions could we make for the consideration of the good people of Ghana to improve upon constitutionalism and our constitutional practices? In order to do so, Madam Chair, I plan beyond the preliminaries to be looking at this, in a sense, in three parts. The preliminaries definitely would engage the question amongst others as to what is constitutionalism. But the three other parts will be to look at the 1992 Constitution and how it came to be because the antecedents color the provisions and the workings. The second part will be to undertake an evaluation of those provisions and workings, particularly in the light of my understanding as to what constitutionalism is. And the final part, Madam Chair, as I suggested, is to be looking at the way forward. Permit me, Madam Chair, however, to associate myself with the remarks which you made about the need for acknowledging this day. 26 years and counting in the life of the Fourth Republic. Let us remember it is the Fourth Republic. And it is the Fourth Republic because there had been a Third Republic. And the transition between the Third and the Fourth Republic was that there had been a break. And if there was a Fourth and there was a Third, then there was a Second and there was a First. And indeed, there was a time when we didn't even have a Republic. And so as we are looking at constitutionalism in the context of the Fourth Republic, Madam Chair, I would like to start by acknowledging those who fought and argued and advocated and in some instances lost their lives to bring it about. The list of acknowledgement is by no means complete, but it will be symbolic to represent that group. And permit me to single out five such persons, namely B.J. Darocha Esquire. Now lead. J.H. Mensah. Now lead. Albert Tubuahin, Professor. Now lead. Former President of the Republic of Ghana, His Excellency John Majukum Kofo. And the present President who is here with us, Nanado Dankwa Akufuadu. They have played their part in concert and together with others in diverse ways to bring the Fourth Republic about, and history should remember the efforts of the likes of these. But this is not the only category of people that we should appreciate and acknowledge, because if there was an advocacy it was a contention against others who, who held a different view. And if there was a fight, 
the sparring was against others. And for those others who appreciated the reality of the time and yielded to the demand for constitutionalism, Ghana similarly requires to appreciate them. And for this reason, permit me to single out some such persons, namely Justice D.F. Fanan. Now lead, retired Captain Kojo Chikata, Paul Victor Obing, and the former president, His Excellency Jerry John Rawlings. The first category of people engaged in a struggle the second category of people with whom they may have struggled in some way yielded. And the Fourth Republic and Ghana acknowledges both. Permit me also to introduce a third category and as a point of contact I will start on a personal note which is to say there is a category of persons out there who have loved and toiled and dedicated their life by diligent duty to the cause of this country. 7th January commemorates the birthday of one such person, and I said I'm being personal here because my own father, 92 years old, today celebrates that birthday. <laughs> and for all such people, young and old, who have told in their different ways, Ghana recognizes them. To be talking about constitutionalism in the Fourth Republic, there are three critical dates that, Madam Chair, you will permit me to spend just a little time talking about. Independence Day on 5th March, but we had an independence which provided that while we were no longer under colonization, we were still under control. The order in council by which the constitution granting independence was given, had as its general tenor and in numerous places provisions which made the point that I just made abundantly clear. We had a prime minister, but we also had a queen who was represented here by a governor general. And in sections four, six, seven, etc., and I'll just choose one, we will see how the apron strings of our independence were tied to the colonial masters. In section six, for example, it reads, the executive power of Ghana is vested in the queen and may be exercised by the queen or by the governor general as her representative. 
Seven to the ministers, one of whom shall be styled the prime minister, shall be appointed by the governor general by instrument under the public seal. And it went on and on and on. Literally, therefore, even though we had independence in 1957, full governmental powers and definitely full executive powers were not vested in Ghana and in Ghanaians. We had a state, literally, of an independent dominion. 1961 sought to reverse this because the 1957 constitution was nearly akin to a situation of procuring a divorce and maintaining a cohabitation arrangement. That which the Fantis talk about, but it didn't make sense for us to be independent and tied to the apron strings. So 1957 had to yield to 1961. There was a process, 1960, there was a process which culminated in a plebiscite held in April the 19th, 23rd, and 27th, and the questions were put and answered. Two things on the Republican status and on the presidency. Madam Chair, permit me for us to appreciate a little bit what the provisions leading up to the 1960 Republican status said. I will just refer to one portion which says, at the proposed plebiscite, the people will be asked to endorse the draft constitution printed as an appendix to this white paper. The government will not consider itself bound to introduce into the constituent assembly a constitution bill which follows word for word the attached draft. So there was a draft constitution, there was a plebiscite to be held, government was prepared to put the question, but not prepared necessarily to be bound by the draft, and then it continued. Indeed, the time able for the enactment of the constitution has been specially designed in order to give ample opportunity for the examination of the details of the constitution. And it may well be that changes of detail, arrangement, and emphasis will be found desirable. In other words, after the draft has been put, in the wisdom of government, there may be need for modification. Modification as to detail, modification as to arrangement, and modification as to emphasis. It will be the duty of the Constituent Assembly, after the people have given their verdict upon the Constitution, to consider each article and see whether it adequately fulfills the purpose for which it is intended. However, if there is a vote at the plebiscite in favor of the proposed Constitution, the government would urge upon the Constituent Assembly that the Constitution should be based upon the following fundamental principles contained in the draft Constitution. These are, and there's a list in which I'll just speak to because they indicate the flavor of the Constitution, the Republican Constitution. One, 
that Ghana should be a sovereign unitary republic with power to surrender any part of her sovereignty to a union of African states. There are two dimensions to one, Madam Chair. The first part of the dimension spoke to the history, particularly in the mid-50s, where there was a claim and clamor, particularly by the NLM, for federation. So the 1960 Constitution was intended to put the stamp down that it's a unitary state. And two, we also know that prior to independence and immediately after independence, Ghana positioned itself under the Osajifu to champion the cause of African liberation. And this first proviso indicated that should it be necessary, Ghana will surrender in part or the whole of its sovereignty for that cause. Let's note that. Let us also note that with the passage of time, in due course, Organization of African Unity was established in 1963, and very recently, or fairly recently, African Union has replaced it. The second proviso mentioned over here is that the head of state and holder of the executive power should be an elected president responsible to the people. Three, that parliament should be a sovereign legislature and should consist of the president and the National Assembly and that the president should have power to veto legislation and to dissolve parliament. And then it continued and the appendix which contained the draft constitution was put to vote. The good people of Ghana then did vote in favor and the constitution was passed. 66, the first republic was overthrown. 69, a second republic was established. 72, it was overthrown. In 79, a third republic was established. And in the early hours, watch night period, December 31st, 81, it was overthrown. And in 1993, 7th January, we've had the Fourth Republic, and it has continued to date. All these constitutions, except the 1961, which lasted six years, the Second and the Third Republic lasted about 27 months. The Fourth Republican Constitution has done 26, and we have started 27 years. The case, therefore, for a commemoration of the Constitution, which governs our affairs now, and which has lasted longest, appears to me to be not only a reasonable case, but a compelling one too. For the two reasons I have said, one, it is a constitution we are presently using, and two, it is the constitution that has lasted the longest by far in multiples, of even the 1960, which lasted six years. 
When the MC was speaking, he thanked His Excellency not only for this, but he also said something about another holy day. I am aware that the country has enjoyed too many holidays, and I hope it is not another holiday. I will suggest, and I will speak about it in a little while, that it should indeed be a day for sober reflection and public education and reorienting ourselves to improve upon public service and constitutionalism. I will be suggesting in due course that on an occasion like this, the commemoration should not be limited to public lectures in the evening, five to seven, which is good to do, but it should be preceded at every district with a citizens' forum. <laughs> Nine o'clock, the district chief executive perhaps the regional police commander, in a meeting facilitated or organized by and moderated by National Commission on Civic Education, will assemble. Every district has schools. Schools will be represented by students and teachers. There should be the media that are present at all such districts, and there will be the opportunity for the district chief executives, and that applies to municipal and metropolitan chief executives, to provide an account of activities over the last year. There should be the opportunity for think tanks or the tertiary institutions that may be available in the district or adjoining districts or in the region to provide a critique of activities in the district over the last year. And there should be an open forum where the citizens and representatives that we have spoken about can make suggestions and ask questions. If we commemorate Constitution Day this way. It will not be another public holiday following immediately after Christmas where we will stay at home and probably neither work nor learn. But it will be an occasion shortly after the last year and before this year goes through for that introspection. Indeed, classical philosophers refer to January as January because it is Janus feast. And it may be an auspicious timing. Janus had two heads, one looking forward, one looking back. Looking back to reflect and looking forward to plan. I am hoping, Your Excellency, Mr. President, you will think about not only institutionalizing it, as you have done with the support of parliament, but making it a meaningful holiday. I will be speaking about constitutionalism, but before I get into it, let me pose a few questions for reflection. Do we have constitutionalism just because we have a written constitution? Do we not know of jurisdictions where there is no written constitution and therefore, if so, can they not have a system of con constitutionalism in the absence of written constitution? Do we not know of instances where people have had written constitutions but their practices do not accord with internationally accepted principles? Nazi Germany, apartheid South Africa, Saddam Hussein's Iraq, and just this morning we heard about either a development, a skirmish, or an accomplished fact in a fellow African country 
which has a written constitution. I am therefore suggesting that constitutionalism goes beyond the existence of a written constitution. In the last 26 years and counting of our constitutional practice, have we not experienced situations where public officers, private citizens, party hacks tend to have more fidelity to party than to principle? Have we not experienced instances of vigilantism, whether by religious adherents or students or party supporters? Can we say that because there is a written constitution and a constitutional dispensation, we've got a functioning, ably functioning regime of constitutionalism. Do we not have established by law courts, but do we not know of instances where cases have taken decades? Some land and chieftaincy matters have traveled three, four decades and counting. Some criminal justice matters have taken so long, and we even recall a documentary which confirms work that the Human Rights Commission had been doing year after year of people remanded and nothing proceeding. Have we not had an experience where election petitions have lasted so long that after trial and after appeal, when the case went in favor of the aggrieved person, the time was gone. Can we therefore say that just because there are constitutional provisions, the workings have been desirable? Are these exceptional cases, isolated cases, or they are sufficiently significant for us to wonder, worry, and desire to do something about it. There's a constitutional arrangement pursuant to which we know of MP's share of the common fund. How is it used to secure favors such that it perpetuates MP's? Is it even defensible by the constitutional provisions. We have experienced situations in the last 26 years that any time there's a change of the guard, particularly from the NDC to the NPP or from the NPP to the NDC, there is a change in the composition and that should not be as disturbing as a holding in abeyance the functioning of councils and boards such that it affects corporations and tertiary institutions. Can we say that in the face of the provisions of the 1992 constitution which call for, in the spirit, probity and accountability, the insertion of indemnity causes in the transitional provisions is compatible with the spirit of constitutionalism. There may have been compelling practical reasons, and in a little while we will see how that got there. But I throw these questions out for us to see that even in the fourth Republican dispensation, the existence of the Constitution has not eliminated significant instances for us soberly and sincerely and dispassionately, regardless of party affiliations, to look at the Constitution and see how we can make it better for Ghana. Madam Chair, my task in the bulk of this lecture will be to see what we can do as a country in areas we have identified as problematic to improve upon our constitutional practices so that constitutionalism will not be a jargon
but it will be a reality. By constitutionalism, therefore, Madam Chair, I am suggesting that it requires the infusion of principle and value. And suffice it for me, Madam Chair, to introduce a, disc a definition which I will be working with. I am suggesting, Madam Chair, that when we talk about constitutionalism, we are talking about a juridical quality by which the structure, the political arrangements, and the governance of a jurisdiction are shaped by and manifest, being shaped by is how it informs. Being manifest is how it is expressed. And it is, it is in areas that are internationally accepted pertaining to the rule of law, human rights, participatory government, limited government, and probity and accountability. If we work with this definition, we can therefore distinguish between what I call formalism and functionalism. And my subtitle is about functionalism. Formalism is simply to say it's in the Constitution. We've got courts. They are independent. We've got a Human Rights Commission and we've got a National Commission for Civic Education and other commissions. We hold elections every four years, and should the need arise by elections, will be held. So we can point to things, but functionalism is empirical. How has it worked and how can we demonstrate it? And I am suggesting that formalism may have, for example, been an example that occurred in a fellow African country today but there was no functionalism. And as a country, we need to improve upon functionalism to complement formalism. Very quickly, we've had 11 dispensations, five of which have been civilian, one of the civilian dispensations was not Republican. So the 1957 was a constitutional dispensation, but it was not a Republican dispensation. And we have had four Republican political dispensations. The political dispensations, however, go beyond the constitutional ones because we have had others where the military has intervened and it has been a disturbing history to date. Indeed, the Third Republic had such a sudden termination and as we are looking at constitutionalism in the Fourth Republic, we should be looking at how it came to be. Because some of the provisions in the 1992 Constitution take their color directly from the immediately preceding arrangement. A number of days into the regime of the PNDC, PNDC didn't refer to itself as a coup d'etat. It referred to itself as a revolution. It referred to itself as a people's revolution. A number of days into the regime, the typical journalist's question 
was asked of one of their prominent members, when are you going to hand over power? Whereupon it invited the reply, rhetorical, hand over to whom? This is the people's government. You can't take the people's power and hand it over to anybody. And a repeat of the rhetorical question, hand over to whom? The revolutionary structures of the period, therefore, following what had happened briefly in 1979, saw properties confiscated. It saw businesses flounder. It saw revolutionary structures, committees for the defense of the revolution, transformed into civil defense organizations, PDCs and WDCs set up. Investigative committees were put in place. Tribunals were put in place. And in the early years, whilst that fear and discipline brought about some cleanliness in towns and cities and people thinking twice, it also caused a lot of people to fear, fear their neighbors, fear their workers, and many people ran into exile. Refugee numbers were huge. But during that period, also, developments took place which moderated the initial revolutionary favor. The climatic conditions appeared to conspire against the government of the day. Farming produce was limited, and hunger and farming emerged. A neighboring country, Nigeria, which had been supplying us oil on credit, failed or refused to be as generous with us in their credit lines, and we needed hard cash. The businesses had no money. Professional services of all sorts suffered, and plenty of people left the country, broken homes and the like. There was the need, therefore, for the financials of the state and the macroeconomic conditions to be put right. And the friends from the USSR and Bulgaria and Eastern Germany and Cuba that from time to time said doctors could not do much to help the country. And it became necessary, therefore, for the revolutionary regime, which was left inclined and left in rhetoric, to look to the right and to Western countries and to the Bretton Woods institutions. A large part of the left rhetoric remained, but the practice was moderated, and as Development partners and IMF and IBRD were giving their conditions. They came with conditionalities to attach to the credit facilities. Initial conditionalities resulted in things like divestitures and layoffs, and there was therefore the need for the country to introduce economic recovery programs and structural adjustment programs, but the social impacts were great. And therefore, there was the introduction of the program of adjustment to mitigate the social costs. All these things led gradually, such that 
by 1986-87, not only was the country right inclined for development support, pressure had been brought to open up the political space for rights and liberties to pursue. In due course, National Commission for Democracy under Justice D.F. Annan, who I spoke about, embarked on some activities which resulted in a document that was created, produced called Evolving True Democracy. District Assembly elections were held in about 87. So between 87 and 91, we had seen the work of the National Commission. The work provided raw material for which a committee of experts was required within a period of two and a half months to work on. That committee was chaired by Nana Dr. S.K.B. Asante, who is in this room. And they presented a draft document, not to the PNDC government, but to the Constituent Assembly that in due course was established. And that Constituent Assembly also did some further work, made some modifications, and a constitution was passed for this country. Let me just mention a few of the key recommendations of the committee of experts. Some of these recommendations, which were not accepted by the Constituent Assembly, still are matters that engage us today. One, there was a recommendation to the effect that there should be a split or bicephalous executive, president and prime minister. There was another recommendation about the council of state. The council of state, they had observed in their report in the second and third republic had been ineffectual. They were then more of a ceremonial or honorific group and so they made that observation about the Council of State and said they did not recommend that. A Council of State that needed to be put in place for a functioning Ghana was not an honorific one, but one that had deliberative powers, I will put it in my own words, much like a second chamber, and one that also had a judicial committee that could do the work of a constitutional court. That recommendation was not accepted by the Constituent Assembly. There are other recommendations which they made, but I will skip them. The Consultative Assembly, which came later, as I said, had the National Commission's report earlier. It had the draft prepared by the Committee of Experts, and the bulk of the provisions in the initial draft were accepted, but in some significant areas, they were, there were departures from the work. According to Nana Atudadze and Professor Kwame Ahoy, in a book which they did as a biography to Justice D. E. Vanan, the indemnity provisions which we find in the 1992 Constitution were not provisions in the work of the con Consultative Assembly. They were not even provisions in the work of the Committee of Experts. So there was a referendum that went out in respect of a document, and much like the plebiscite which ushered in the First Republic, where government took a position that it could 
my words, modify or tinker. We have a similar situation as far as the Fourth Republic, where there were provisions that were not the subject matter of the Constituent Assembly. Elections were held on the revised and be that as it may, the results were overwhelmingly in favor of the Constitution. The results, the turnout was low, less than 44%. But of the less than 44% who turned out, over 92% voted in favor. And we see I've isolated four main areas that we see in the work running through the report on evolving a true democracy, which is the work of the National Commission for Democracy, through the work of the Constituent Assembly, but with a variation by the Committee of Experts, strong president. The 1992 Constitution makes our president a very strong one. The 1992 Constitution has provisions for tribunals, regional tribunals and other tribunals set out by parliament. It has provisions on decentralization which speak to a non-partisan house, even though the practice has been partisan, where we have assemblies, but there are people nominated by identified groups and by government, and where, despite the stamp of approval of others of the assembly itself, the appointment is by the President. All of these are features which go back to the PNDC era. I make no judgment as to whether they are good or bad. I only state as a matter of historical record that that is what has happened. Having said that, I would very briefly look at the provisions and the workings. But my concern is more on the workings than on the provisions. Alexander Pope, a poet, has said, for forms of government, let fools contend. Whatever is best administered is best. In other words, there is no one constitution that is good for any country or all countries. Each country must develop its own. So Ghana must do its own. Therefore, most of the provisions in the existing constitution are not problematic to me as to the provisions themselves, but as to the workings. There are, however, three that disturb me, and I want to speak about them. The constitution sets out a job description for a member of parliament. A member of parliament is going to undertake serious deliberation. You must have the capacity to reason matters through and argue your case out. A member of parliament, because parliament is required by law to do so, a member of parliament must have the capacity to interrogate international agreements and make sense of them. Where for lesser responsibilities at workplaces and departments, qualifications and experience are described and called for age and sound mind and few other important but insufficient things are done. It may be controversial to suggest, but necessary to suggest, that we should match the job description of parliament and its parliamentarians with those who are qualified. And to 
the extent that political parties present candidates, they should be held responsible for the caliber and the competence of the people they present at all constituencies. <laughs> the experience of the last 26 years has suggested there are many parliamentarians who do not report to parliament, who report when there are critical matters to be voted upon and sometimes ferried in on beds. Some who are there but won't say anything. <laughs> and the like. And that reminds me of the story about, it may be apocryphal, it is not. This MP, in one of the previous dispensations from Gosso, whose constituents were complaining that they had sent him and he never spoke. And one day when he saw the lights of the cameras on him, he got the speaker's attention and asked the question, what about the Gosso road? <laughs> That was his only contribution in the life of that parliament. <laughs> in typical story, they would have added Anchebia, but I will not add that. <laughs> Parliamentarians must be equipped to do the job that is expected of them. Not for the sake of themselves and their pecs, not for the sake of the party, but for the sake of the people and the republic. The second area that I think we should be looking at is the Council of State, and I will go back to the observation of the Committee of Experts, looking at First Republic, Second Republic, Council of Elders, nice people, good credentials, they go there. What they do there, we don't know. So we can't say they don't do anything. <laughs> but we also can't say, <laughs> and I didn't say that. <laughs> Obviously, on the advice of and in consultation with our expressions that have been used in the Constitution, and they've been judicially interpreted. But if the Council of State is not merely advisory of the high office of His Excellency, the President, but is seen as a state institution to advance the interests of the state, then on matters that you are consulted or your advice is sought, or on matters raised on your own motion, there should be no inhibition in the public knowing your stand. The one to take the advice is not bound to take the advice but the advice should be known by the people who sent you there to give advice on our behalf. I take the view that the Council of State seems to still answer to the description, and I'm looking in the direction of Nana Dr. S. K. B. Asante because he said it in his committee, that it is ineffectual. And if it is ineffectual, we have two options. One option is that it's a waste of time. The other option is make it effectual. And I think that the status quo is not satisfactory. And it must be abolished, or it must be fundamentally revised and restructured. And I believe that this is a matter that I wish to leave with the organizers 
of the lecture and the good people of Ghana. The third area of critical concern to me is the National Development Planning Commission. The provisions of the Constitution place this important commission, and there is probably nothing wrong with it, but there are concerns about implications. It places this commission under the executive. If we look at where it is done, Articles 87, 86, 87, and appointed by the president to advise the president, and it has been done by constitutional design such that in its workings, there is, in effect, a four-year time horizon. And when you look beyond four years to 10 years, Hello? When a mic is before you and you are testing, it's not with hello, it's testing one, two, one, two. <laughs> That was Apam Dada. Apam Fufur is hello. <laughs> the National Development Planning Commission should be mandated to look to 20, 40, 100 year horizons such that it is capable of being translated into reality. Mr. Chairman, for these reasons, I suggest that the outstanding constitutional review work, which has not been completed, despite a white paper in 2012, should be one that you may wish to be looking at. We know, however, that beyond these provisions, the Constitution has been weak in its workings. Where party politics has been captured, by foot soldiers, Parachiki, by bank rollers, funders, by godfathers. And there's nothing wrong with party politics because in every mature democracy, they work well. But we must make us work well. District assemblies and where are public services? I have spoken about the need to commemorate this day in a way other than a holiday for rest and recreation, but for reflection. And I think that that point needn't be uh, repeated again. I also believe, Mr. Chair, that the number of MPs and the quality of MPs is problematic. By a practice of the Electoral Commission, somehow there is a certain proportion of voters to MP. And now Ghana is 30 million. We've got a few more regions. If the Electoral Commissioner is so minded, using current projections as to population, we can increase the number of MPs and so on. The Constitution itself said 140. I believe that the Constitution should set a practical, reasonable number of MPs. Cap it. With 270, reducing it to 260 or 250 or 200 may be problematic, so we can cap it at the status quo. But the formula should be that the number of seats allocated to a region should correspond to the population of that region. We have a present arrangement where some regions 
with smaller numbers have a disproportionately larger number of MPs. But the heading under which all of these is discussed in the Constitution is representation of the people. And so if we go by this formula, the regions which have more people will have more MPs corresponding with their contribution to the population of Ghana. And finally on this point, I believe that MPs should not be ministers. Not that there is not a good case for MPs being ministers because in some democracies we do have that. But how has it worked? There is so much business to be done in a country that is hungry for development. And I even suggest that there are so many competent people out there. If you choose to be MP, that is what you chose to do for four years. Go and do MP work. At least if you get it, you are guaranteed for your job for the period, unless you have sent yourself from a number of sittings and then uh, you are kicked out, etc., etc. But focus on that, be compensated for it, and do the work. But don't encumber MP position, encumber minister position, and you are not doing both well. I have made a case earlier. This is a case of serving two masters and despising one. And we know which one will be despised. So the country should move in that direction. Finally, Mr. Chairman, I'll skip a few other points in elaborating them. I wish to go back to the tenure of boards and university councils and to the suggestion to complete the review process. In the interest of the Republic, banks and state enterprises and polytechnics, colleges of education, universities, etc., should not be impeded from taking serious decision because the country has had the good fortune of doing elections and there being a change of the guard. I know that there are constitutional impediments and this has been the result, but it is a result that is not good for the country and the tenure should be secured and the businesses of those bodies should continue. At about 2010, the National the Constitution Review Commission was commissioned to do its work. In 2011, it completed its work and submitted a bulky report. In 2012, there was a government white paper, and the government white paper accepted some things, it didn't accept certain things. And between 2012 and 2019, the report and the white paper have not seen the country move forward in any significant direction, constitutionally speaking. This situation is unacceptable. If we don't like that exercise as a country, we should tell the country the politicians set it up and it has gone with their time. If on the other hand we see some merit in the review, the white paper is still the white paper of the government of Ghana. The composition of the government of Ghana has changed. It was a work started by the late president his Excellency at Tamils. By the time the white paper, white paper came out, it was a white paper of His Excellency John Dramani Mahama, and it has remained. It's still a white paper of the government of Ghana. And so the government of Ghana 
Now, His Excellency. Lalado Danko Akufuado has a fine opportunity of picking it up, dusting it, where the government feels they will accept the existing white paper at will, where it feels it will not, it is at liberty to vary. But I am on this score suggesting that the exercise of constitutional review should be completed one way or the other. And maybe His Excellency may be minded to put in place a team to pick it up and complete that. From the white paper itself, that is there in 2012, we see some instances on decentralization. As I said, in a number of areas, including decentralization and local government, and this is my penultimate slide. Decentralization and local government was a PNDC regime brought into the National Commission for Democracy work, largely accepted by the committees of uh, the Committee of Experts on the Decentralization Part. Then the Constituent Assembly put it in place, and we have that now. The government, the, the review committee proposed significant changes, and the government rejected those proposals. And government is entitled to reject those proposals. But what is this government's view? And I mentioned some of these because we have heard of an interest in voting for districts, municipal, and metropolitan chief executives, the introduction of partisan politics at that level, and in a sense, more participatory, transparent arrangements. If the white paper says, government does not accept the recommendations that it should be amended to empower parliament, dot, 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 to make provision for partisan elections, one government's view is clear. The populace has had a different view of this government, but it is not in any white paper. So the position of government is not the position announced. The position of government is the position in government's white paper. And that goes to the other things. I just mention it to support the view. I'm fan to baby order to talk. Let us put things where they ought to be put so that they are not left hanging. Madam Chair. Let me conclude on the following basis. Having done somewhat of a historical conspectus, having done somewhat of an attempt to explain and define constitutionalism and develop a taxonomy and to particularly differentiate between formalism and functionalism, having traced the antecedents which have shaped the content of the 1992 Constitution, have been reviewed the general workings over the last 26 years, and pointing out three critical areas in my view that as to provisions we have to change, but more generally the workings have to be examined. I am of the view that we have done very well. But I am also of the teacher's view that there is much room for improvement. God bless us all.
A lecture so powerful that we had to change the microphone. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together again. Now we shall hear from Professor Kojo Pumpuni Asante. He is the Director for Advocacy and Policy Engagement for the Ghana Center for Democratic Development. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Professor Kojo Pumpuni Asante. Good evening, Your Excellency Nana Dankwa Fuado, President of the Republic of Ghana, Your Excellency, the Right Honorable Professor Michael Quay, Excellencies, Ministers of State, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much uh, for this honor done me. I, have, uh, I, I understand I have two minutes, so I'm going to be very, very short, but please, I'm not a professor. I'm a doctor, but I'm not a professor. I'm here today just to make a few remarks uh, on this maiden ed edition of the Constitution Day. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, in my 13 years as a researcher and an advocate, I have developed a very interesting habit. Hardly do I go into any discussion, meeting, or workshop conference or even a radio program on governance without a copy of the Constitution of the Republic of Ghana. Now, this is because you never know when you might find yourself in a constitutional fight. And indeed, there are very few places in the world where non-constitution experts like myself are able to recite provisions of the national constitution of the CAF. So I think Ghana is quite unique in that regard. From my perspective, it reflects two main attitudes that we have developed as Ghanaians in relation to our constitution. First, we rightly treat the constitution as a living document. It's a codification of our collective development aspirations, which we might constantly engage challenge, revise, where necessary, defend, and promote. However, in treating the 1992 Constitution as a living document, we have also welded ourselves to revere the express commands and injunctions in the Articles of the Constitution, and not so much the spirit of the Constitution. Therefore, Unless the Constitution expressly commands or prohibits, we are less inclined to act. Your Excellency, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the first attitude is consistent with the notion of constitutionalism, as espoused today very ably by Professor Bozzi Simpson, while the second attitude undercuts it. Our 1990 constitution is not just an agreement of Ghanaians on how they should be governed or to prosper, but it is a liberal constitution underpinned by a value system. These democratic values, including participation, accountability, responsiveness, inclusion, checks and balances, and transparency, have to be a way of life. It's our worldview. I dare say it's a state of mind. The Constitution must become our frame and guiding principle to actualizing the aspirations of Ghanaians. And it is through this purview that our Constitution will del deliver for us our development aspirations. Now at CDD Ghana, we have no equivocation that democracy is the best form of government. That's why we are called Ghana Center for Democratic Development. However, we are alive to the reality that this political arrangement will survive and thrive if we deliver on the political, socioeconomic, and cultural aspirations of Ghanaians. Thus, on this maiden edition of Constitution Day, we pledge our continued commitment to a constitution 
fit for that purpose. And we invite all guardians to make such a commitment for the prosperity and stability of our republic. Happy Constitution Day. Happy Constitution Day. Now we shall hear from the Deputy Chair for the NCCE. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Kathleen Adi. Good evening, Your Excellency President of the Republic of Ghana, Nana Adodankwa Akufuado, Your Excellency, Right Honorable Speaker of Parliament, Honorable Professor Michael Quay, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Chairman, the Commission, and staff of the National Commission for Civic Education, I bring you greetings on this auspicious day. As the institution established by the very constitution we celebrate today, with a special mandate of ensuring that citizens of Ghana are familiar and indeed live by the tenets of the 1992 constitution, we are excited to be part of this historic occasion. The NCC has always acknowledged the importance of our constitution and have mainstreamed the education on our constitution into all the programs we undertake. Each year, we hold a Constitution Week, where activities include a national, dialogue, a national dialogue. Now that Constitution Day has come to stay, we hope our work in promoting this Constitution in order to further entrench our democracy will be further enhanced. It has already been said, and indeed, we all know, that the 1992 Constitution has underpinned our democracy for 26 years now but it is also unique in other ways. It is the only constitution amongst the four